Modern studies as a school subject is unique to Scotland. It's a mixture of politics, sociology and current affairs, very much with a contemporary emphasis. So why don't they study something similar in schools around the world? Well, I would imagine in other countries they've thought about it and thought it's just too open to political bias. OK, learning the lessons of history, that's education. Discussing contemporary events without the benefit of hindsight, that's much less valuable educationally. Now, even if the modern studies syllabus was a paragon of neutrality, the teachers who deliver it, in many cases, won't be. I mean, we all know that the teaching profession in general is skewed towards the sort of left, liberal, progressive end of the spectrum. But before we look at the course content, the resources and how it's presented, we're going to listen to Dr. Britton of Education Scotland and Glasgow University delivering the keynote speech at the Modern Studies Association conference last year. In the meantime, young people who may or may not uh, be receiving, I'm talking globally here, who may or may not be receiving a, a political uh, literacy entitlement in their schools are taking action for themselves. They're not waiting. They're going on strike, uh, inspired by Greta Thunberg. Um, and so there's a very dynamic uh, global context, but one that's also full of concern around and that rise in authoritarianism and populism. Uh, I also, wanna, as well as try not to be too nostalgic, also swore I wouldn't use the T word today. Uh, just suffice to say that uh, my recent uh, modern studies uh, students would talk about uh, a certain person as being the gift that keeps giving uh, in the classroom because uh, whatever else you might say uh, about the, the president, uh, there's never a dull moment in terms of modern studies. And uh, I think there's a role for modern studies in uh, promoting voter registration. And again, I know many of you will be involved in that agenda, but that should actually be at the core of, of what we do uh, and including the Votes at 16 agenda. Uh, I think some of it is about channeling the, the righteous anger of young people uh, in uh, positive directions. Um, when they look around and see the state of the world, uh, I think increasingly they're, they're not putting up with this idea that, well, young people will sort that out. Uh, that, you know, and you defer the responsibility for environmental catastrophe to the next generation. They're actually saying, and that's one of the really interesting messages that's coming across from young people is, well, no, actually, it's not us that have caused this. It's you as in the adults. Uh, so channeling that anger and showing that there are still ways for uh, political influence around that. So there are. It's very approving of climate striking kids. Um, it objects to authoritarianism, popularism. In ordinary parlance, people mean by that Trump and Brexit. And then he has a sort of side swipe at Donald Trump. Then he talks about voter registration. They want to get more young people registered and more young people voting. Well, I think you can debate that a little bit. It's well known that young people tend to be more towards the left end of the political spectrum. I mean, is there a special project to encourage older people to vote as well? I mean, they're going to have the, the situation where you have a modern studies lesson in the morning, then you go and vote in the afternoon at age 16. He also says that the teachers should be behind the votes at 16 agenda. Uh, why? That's a political issue. Why are you taking a stance on it? Um, just to clarify, in Scotland, 16-year-olds can vote in parliamentary elections. In the UK, uh, they can't. In, in UK elections, they can't. Uh, but why should that be something that modern studies teachers are promoting? And then lastly, he talks about the righteous anger that young people have against adults because we cause all of the world's problems, uh, such as climate change. So there from Dr. Britton, we have unabashed political partiality on display from the man from Education Scotland. Did we expect anything else? Well, no, not really. So with modern studies, the problem's deep. First part of the problem, the choice of topics that they put on the syllabus. If you ask the Green Party to come up with a set of topics to put on the syllabus, they would come up with what they think's important. If you ask me, I might come up with a different set of topics to put on the syllabus. Let's see what they did choose to put on the syllabus. Then once they've chosen the topics, are those topics treated in an even-handed and impartial manner? Is the syllabus neutral? The teaching resources used, what do they look like? Well, we're going to have a look at that. Then the icing on the cake, how is it actually taught by the teachers? To what extent are teachers biased? Well, we're going to have a look at that as well. Some teachers have helpfully been putting their lessons on YouTube during the lockdown. So that gives us a bit of 
in sight, but we'll see more of that towards the end. Now, when we're talking about the syllabus for modern studies, it's not very creative, actually. It's basically the same at every level. For National 5, for Higher, for Advanced Higher, they treat very similar topics. And it's basically three parts. There's a part about democracy, how Parliament works, uh, the job of MSPs, MPs, etc. There's a section about social issues, which is either crime or social inequality. And then there's also a section about international affairs. Now, my job in this video is to convince you that there's a problem of bias in each of these areas. So I'm going to start with the Modern Studies syllabus from SQA and look at some of the general points that it makes in the documentation. Our candidates can develop their political literacy and citizenship skills in the following ways. Writing a letter to a local or national representative. Visiting a local representative at their surgery office. In other words, the same part of the course is to write let a letter to your MP, to your MSP, or whatever. So basically, they're teaching them political activism. To be a political activist is part of their education. And I think that is not right. Let's look at the last thing here. Uh, by examining social issues, either within the social inequality or crime and the law areas of study, candidates develop an understanding of the issues of diversity and equality. Now, develop an understanding. Do they really mean develop an understanding? No, they don't really mean that. What they mean is swallow the philosophy that normally goes under the banner of equality and diversity. Here's another section. Whatever the international issue taught, it should be possible to have a focus on rights within that issue. The United Nations Convention on Human Rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child would be ideal documents to use here. Candidates could be issued with a full list of the rights of the child and asked to identify the rights which they felt were most important for the issue they are studying. Again, I would disagree with that. I think human rights have a place. They've also got a lot of problems associated with them. Generally, people on the left of politics are very keen on human rights. People on the right are a bit more sceptical. But they're saying in Scotland, you should be looking at every issue through a human rights lens, no matter what it is. And that's biased. Active participation in global issues could be highlighted through school support for developmental charities, involvement in environmental projects, or increased awareness of the role of environmental and rights pressure groups. In other words, it's encouraging the teachers to introduce pupils to various pressure groups and political activist groups. And not any old ones, but environmental and human rights ones. That's not the full spectrum, so it's directing them to those with a particular political outlook. Right, so following up on that, let's see which organisations are featured in the textbook. Amnesty International. Pro-abortion, pro-prostitution organisation. We disagree with them on many things. That's in the textbook. Uh, Scotland Against Criminalising Communities. That's an organisation that opposes sort of anti-terrorism measures. Pupils are talking about Liberty, again, a very progressive, liberal, left-leaning uh, organisation. World Wildlife Fund, uh, again, another environmental charity. Shelter, fair enough. Uh, Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, uh, CND, Greenpeace, CND logo in the textbook. There's another animal rights charity. It says protesters at Fast Lane against uh, nuclear weapons. Now, you may be saying here, oh, I've just picked out those ones. I haven't just picked out those ones. That is the whole lot. If you can show me any examples in modern studies textbooks where it refers to campaigning groups that would be on a different wavelength to those, well, I'd be interested to see them. For the moment, it just looks like the textbook authors have written to the Scottish Green Party and said, please give us a list of your favourite organisations and we'll put them in the textbook. So look at the syllabus itself. One of the sections is about democracy. How does the political system work? How do the parliaments operate? Now, obviously, that's a sensible thing to study. And in theory, that's politically neutral. But even in this section, you can see SMP think creeping in. For example, about representation, the role of MSPs. Fine. Point number two, representation of women and minority groups. It's as though the SMP have written the syllabus, isn't it? So what does the textbook include? Gender equality in the Scottish Cabinet. 
When she was elected as First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon pledged to put gender equality at the heart of the government. She announced her first cabinet with a 50-50 gender balance in November 2014 and maintains this balance. Nicola Sturgeon said her cabinet was a clear demonstration that this government will work hard in all areas to promote women, to pr create gender equality, and it sends out a strong message that the, that the business of redressing the gender balance in public life starts right here in government. I mean, the SNP may as well have taken out an advert in the textbook to put that in. So the syllabus raises the issue the SNP would like to be there. And then the textbook effectively like publishes a Nicola Sturgeon advert in it. No alternative view, no counter perspective, just straightforward promotion of Nicola Sturgeon in the textbook. That's from National 5. Well, here's another section for the textbook, a tiny little bit about tax. And let's see what it says. So it talks about the fact that the, the Scottish government changed the tax rate slightly a couple of years ago. Let's listen to the last sentence here. This means that the Scottish government has more money to use for devolved areas and that the lowest earners now pay less tax than their counterparts in the rest of the UK. So it's just win-win, isn't it? No discussion of any disadvantages of the changes the SNP made. Just the SNP has made these changes and there's one benefit, and not only one benefit, there's two benefits of it. Topic covered, let's move on to the next topic. I've got another one here again, this is supposed to be just about how the Parliament works, so talking about a Members' Bill, the example, Monica Lennon of Labour, with the ridiculous sort of free periods product bill. And again, it describes it in glowing terms, no counter-argument at all, not even the hint that there might be any problems or any reasons not to go down this road. So Monica Lennon, again, she may as well have taken an advert out in the textbook. Right, so talking about the political system, various aspects they could talk about. Trade unions gets a massive amount of space. So lists of different trade unions. Uh, this is a list of different types of industrial action that can be taken. Uh, so extremely disproportionate. You'd almost think that the person writing the textbook is very keen on the trade union movement. It's as though the Labour Party has you know, been able to write that section of the book. Okay, we've got a bit here about the influence of TV and radio. While newspapers can present a biased view of events, the law requires television news to be fair and balanced. So it goes on saying that you can therefore rely on TV news. I mean, how many people agree with that? But children in Scotland are taught that the BBC, for example, is fair and balanced. Right, that is not a fair and balanced thing to teach young people. Now we'll briefly consider the international section of the syllabus now. A lot of people study the United States of America and the coverage of that in textbooks is really, really negative. Huge proportion of it is about race problems. Loads of things about gun violence, problems related to that. So basically a really negative and basically a real left-wing perspective on the problems of the United States of America. I'm not going to look at examples of that particularly. Another option to study in the international section is terrorism. I've heard that North Lanarkshire Council actually banned schools from teaching the terrorism module because they thought it might engender Islamophobia. But let's have a look at what we've got in one of the textbooks on the subject of terrorism. You won't believe this. Right, religious ideology. Religious extremism continues to be the most likely cause of a terrorist attack. People who commit terrorist attacks in the name of their religion are referred to as religious extremists. While organizations such as Al-Qaeda and the Taliban often dominate the news headlines, it's important to understand that extremism happens in many different religions. So Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, it sounds like that's just the biased media keep telling us about those, whereas there's equal problems in other religious groups as well. Let's read more about it. So carrying on in this textbook. In April 2013, the American government listed evangelical Christianity as the highest terrorist threat to its national security. And then it had a helpful box at the side of the book to explain what this dangerous evangelical Christianity is. And it says it's belonging to a Christian group that stresses the authority of the Bible. Now, even if it was true that the American government had done that, I'll come on to that in a minute, to choose to put that in, in that way, is pretty outrageous. 
But I had done some research. You know, 2013, American government, evangelical Christians, terrorism threat. What could I find? The only thing I could find was a single occasion when some sort of equality and diversity training to a military group was given by some individuals that said that evangelical Christians, you know, are the big danger. And lots of people were shocked and appalled by this and they complained. There's a bit of a controversy about it in the media. And the army said, look, this was not official. This was just these people ad-libbing. So it seems as if it might be that it's just that little incident that's found its way into the modern studies textbook. OK, we'll move on to the social inequality section. This reads as though it's been written by a committee of Nicola Sturgeon, Jeremy Corbyn and Patrick Harvey. Right, let's start here. Reasons why income and wealth inequality exist. This is from the syllabus. Wage differentials. I mean, talk about stating the obvious. Uh, going down the list, racial and gender discrimination. So the children are inducted into the sort of identity politics grievance mindset. Another thing that results in inequality. I mean, the assumption is inequality is a bad thing. It's something that needs solving. Right, another uh, thing that results in inequality the capitalist economy leading to unequal rewards. Reasons why health inequalities exist. Now notice, see, this is the SNP mindset. The Labour are the same. Basically, the whole Scottish Parliament's the same. They don't look at things in absolute terms. Everything's got to be to do with inequalities. That's what really matters. Doesn't matter how many people are dying. Doesn't matter how healthy people are overall. It's the inequalities that really matter. And this syllabus just reflects the views of the government. So reasons why health inequalities exist. Okay, you guessed it. Ethnicity, gender, all these injustices. Uh, the effect of inequality on a group or groups in society. Gender inequality and health issues. Ethnic inequality and health issues. Just inducting kids into the left-leaning identity politics mindset. Here's a question from an exam. Social and economic inequality continues to exist in Scotland, in the UK. That's almost implying that, OK, it is continuing to exist. Obviously, we wish it had been dealt with by now. But for some strange reason, it does continue. Then it says, explain in details two reasons why social and economic inequality continue to exist in Scotland. Well, I think the answer to that can only be because the communist revolution hasn't happened yet. Next one, social and economic inequality has a negative consequence on families. Explain in detail two reasons why social and economic inequality has a negative consequence on families. Again, it's assuming that what they mean by inequality basically is poverty. But they've got to put everything in the very left wing sort of Marxist view. It's all about, actually about inequality. So inequality has a negative consequence for families. What if a family is really wealthy? Is that a negative consequence? But again, it's a very left-leaning philosophy that's underlying this whole course. Right, this, I think, is from the BBC website for their teaching resources for, I think, higher modern studies. Sociological theories. There are two main approaches to sociological theory which attempt to explain income and wealth inequalities. Number one, functionalism. Theorists on the right of politics may explain inequality as part of a natural order of a society as hierarchical. People with skills, talents and abilities are better rewarded than those without. Number two, conflict theory. People on the left of politics may argue that inequality is a consequence of those at the top of society dictating the economic and social system to maintain their privileged position. It is society as a collective that causes inequality. I would say the whole course is predicated on the truth of conflict theory. But let's see how the BBC illustrates this. So on the left, we have Mr. Individualist. And it says, traditionally conservative. Right, what does he do? M6 toll. Well, he makes you pay to drive along motorways. Whereas next to him, we've got the lovely traditionally Labour lady. What does she do? Does she make you pay to drive along motorways? No, no. What she does instead is makes the National Health Service. Which one do you prefer? Which side would you like to align yourself with? I mean, if you can't see the bias in this, it's probably not worth watching the rest of the video. But anyone can see that's clearly totally biased, apart from the BBC and the SQA and the Scottish Educational Establishment. Right, moving on through this section. This is the thing 
Children who learn about in Scottish schools, they've plunged so far down the league tables in maths and literacy that the government's withdrawn them from the international league tables. But meanwhile, they're busy studying this sort of thing. Um, percentage of female MSPs, uh, openly gay LGBT MSPs, 7%. There's only 2.2% in the population. Does that mean there's too many? I would imagine they're not too bothered about that. Uh, privately educated, proportion in the parliament, proportion in the population. Again, just the sort of thing someone of a left-leaning political persuasion would want young people to be learning about. Another table about the number of female MSPs. Well, how about this bit? Women's traditional domestic responsibilities lead them to suffer higher levels of anxiety and depression. In other words, being at home, being a homemaker, looking after your own kids leads to anxiety and depression. Therefore, the mission of society must be to rescue mothers from this fate for the sake of their mental health. No alternative view, no questioning about that. Unbelievable. Right, here we've got another SMP advert in the textbook. Talking about the best start grants that are given in the uh, UK and in Scotland as well. In Scotland, you get a slightly higher payment for the first child and subsequent children if you're uh, relatively poor. They've got an account here from Con Connie Rumsby, mother of three from Glasgow, whose baby is six months old. And she said, well, you can guess what she said, oh, she thinks it's really wonderful to have this extra money. Absolutely fantastic. In fact, that quote is actually from the Scottish Government website. So the textbook quotes glowing reviews of SNP policy uh, from the government's website and six of them in the textbook to teach children how wonderful the Scottish SNP government really is. Our one next government public sector cuts again this is from the textbook one of the coalition governments in other words conservative governments economic policies was to reduce the number of public sector workers while at the same time encouraging growth in the private sector no explanation of why that might be a good idea of course this strategy had a detrimental impact on female employment more women than men work in local government and other public services and the extensive cuts to council budgets has led to a significant reduction in staffing Again, completely one-sided, could have been written by any one of the feminist organisations funded by the taxpayer in Scotland. The other thing with this is the Scottish Conservative Party haven't got the wit to realise that the education system has been used to turn people against them, basically. I know the Scottish Conservatives are very wishy-washy, but still, even the differences that there are between, for example, the SNP and the Conservatives, children are taught that the SNP is right, the Conservatives are wrong, and the Conservatives don't even realise what's going on. So we've got a table here about different proportions of boys and girls studying different subjects. So never mind getting better at maths, English, anything like that, learning about geography or history. They need to learn about the problem of boys and girls choosing different subjects. Alleged problem. Well, it looks like modern studies is part of the problem. Far more girls than boys choosing it. So maybe ditching modern studies might help to solve that so-called problem. Right, more from the textbook, again, inducting them into the sort of hard left ideology. In March 2018, Professor Peter Hopkins rejected claims that Police Scotland was not institutionally racist, saying racism were, saying racism were present. OK, a bit more time in the English might have been better. Throughout Scottish society, culture and politics. So a box there explaining what institutional racism is. And then it's about um, Scotland's stop and search statistics revealed everyday racism. The figures had revealed that ethnic minorities are four times more likely to be stopped by the police. Right, who wants to be focusing on these issues? People on the sort of identity politics obsessed, left of politics. So if that's what they want, this is what they get in the textbook. Some more is a straightforward feminist indoctrination here. This audit does not reveal pay discrimination, which is illegal, but the reality of the glass ceiling. No debate about that. Is it real? Isn't it real? I mean, people, women get to the top of all sorts of organisations, but no, the reality of the glass ceiling. Airlines have some of the widest gender pay gaps. At EasyJet, 94% of the pilots are men, average salary 92,400, whereas 69% of the cabin crew are women, earning an average of 24,000. 800. And the obvious thing there is they're saying this is a problem that needs to be solved, whereas someone like myself would say this isn't actually a problem, this is just men and women choosing different careers 
and an airline takes people with very specialized skills. Just to say at this point, if you're getting more and more wound up by this video, maybe you're a modern studies teacher, who, who knows? Why don't you come on to our live stream and debate the matter with me? We're always looking for people to come on and argue the other side of the case. So this could be your opportunity. Just get in touch with us at the Scottish Family Party and we'll see what we can do. Right, I'm just going to have a very quick look at the crime section as well. The other a social issue that uh, students can study. Uh, just a very quick few highlights from the textbook. Uh, those most likely to break the law and commit crime are white working class males under the age of 25. Now, I find that a bit annoying because you know full well that I'm uh, sure you can question that statistic. But let's say the actual statistic was that the most uh, crime prone group in society were black males under the age of 21. Let's say that was the fact. Would that have made it into the textbook? No way. No way. So I wish they just leave these issues alone. We don't need to learn about that at all. Kids do not need to learn about racial uh, crime rates. But if they're going to talk about it, then they should be willing to talk about all of them. And I would imagine they're not. Right, what else have we got here? Here's a classic bit of sociology for you. Most people living in poverty do not break the law, but some do. Poverty can lead to boredom. This may encourage some people to commit crimes to give them something to do. Right, biological theories of crime. So looking at different causes of crime, obviously being from a left-leaning perspective, they want to blame it all on society. They don't really want it to be to do with individuals. But let's have a look here, biological theories. Biological explanations of crime assume that some people are born criminals. Right, that's a really clumsy way of wording, isn't it? It doesn't need to assume that at all. Uh, and are visibly and mentally distinct. Visibly distinct, that's obviously ridiculous, isn't it? But anyway. Uh, from non-criminals, which means that some people are more psychologically predisposed to committing criminal acts. There's then a sensible paragraph about psychological explanations uh, for crime. Then it goes on to this. Other research suggests that people who commit crime have are more likely to look a certain way and have different physical characteristics. So it talks about things back from in the basically from the 19th century where someone thought that criminals were more likely to have a proportioned face-to-head ratio. That doesn't even make any sense. Um, you know, a twisted nose, long arms, whatever. And it says uh, tattoos that have di chromosomal differences. Then it finishes by saying, however, many of the biological theories of crime have been disproved and are not very relevant to our current understanding of why people commit crime. So you see what they're doing here. They're presenting some sort of ancient, discredited, wacky theories about biological explanations for crime or factors involved in crime. Then they're dismissing the whole of biological explanations as a wanna because they've focused on these wacky, outdated theories. They haven't given it a fair hearing. For example, people with low IQ are more likely to commit crime. That's a really important thing to understand. But they've just thrown this all out because they've deliberately undermined this uh, explanation because they want to go on and say it's all society's fault because they're very left-leaning. Well, it's now time to turn to the teaching. Now, normally in the normal run of things in a school, it's against the rules to film your teacher. So we hear all sorts of stories about teachers being biased uh, in their political views they're presenting to classes. But we don't normally get the, the solid evidence. However, during lockdowns, a lot of teachers took to filming themselves and put it on YouTube. So I found some uh, modern studies lessons that we're going to have a look at here. Now, the teachers presenting this, I would imagine they're completely oblivious to the fact that they're being completely biased in their presentation because they live within the Scottish educational bubble and it's what the syllabus says, what the textbooks say, it's what all the colleagues probably say. So they're, they're probably not aware of what they're doing. But in any case, let's have a look at this. Um, we've also obviously seen a massive uh, change in the nature of, of the family structure. So we see, what I mean by that is we see a lot more single parents. That's that's perfectly fine. That's a, a very normal thing. There's probably many of you watching this who perhaps live at home with just a mum or just a dad or, or maybe even with a, a, another carer. 
like a, a grandparent or something along those lines. But but that means that obviously that traditional sort of uh, family unit where you had the two parents who perhaps both could be earning um, puts a bit of strain on it. Or even more importantly, when you had two parents, um, I know certainly when I was when I was younger. When I was at primary school, my mum was at home, which meant my dad went off here and here and um, some money, and it meant that they didn't have to pay for child costs. And child costs are really, child caring costs are really, really expensive. It's a, it's a real burden on, on a lot of people. So that changing nature of the family has also meant that people are having to spend more money on childcare. So you've got the message. Family structures in our society have changed. So single parenthood is much more common. And don't you dare suggest that there's anything negative about that but it's created a situation where we've now got a problem to solve because a lot of families can't cope and they need more money to pay for uh, child care. Our view would be that it's actually unsustainable to have just any and every family form and say that's fine and for the state to be picking up the pieces in terms of child care. What we ideally want is a family where there are mum and dad present to look after the kids so we don't have this problem in the first place. I know that 2% might seem like a really small amount. Um, but when you look at that on the scale of a population, if you've got 5 million people living in Scotland, um, which would mean about 2.5 million women, 2% is still quite a lot of people. So it's still a significant number. So the teacher here is obviously getting into a stride about all the injustices that women suffer in society. And here she's got a statistic that 20% of women and 18% of men live in poverty. A difference of 2%. And in those statistics, that's fairly trivial, but she's really wanting to emphasize it and make it as dramatic as possible. So it's no surprise really that if women suffer for, from inequality throughout their lives, it's no surprise that when they get to an older age that they suffer kind of even more from that. Yeah, um, I mean, the only thing to, to not not to not to jump in and sort of start some sort of gender-based argument, but the only thing I would say about that is, is obviously, as we will see, that that is also a, 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 as a result of the fact that there is a lot of more older women who live true. to outlive yeah, the men. You know, yeah. like, there is there, there is a, there is an imbalance in this country in, in terms of life expectancy, and we men uh, suffer at the, at the end of that. But it, it's not enough yeah, actually. No, to absolutely. Dis, to um, it's, it's a very good point. And then next, the male teacher comes back with a sensible point, but he's very apologetic about it, obviously. And at, at the end, he sort of throws it away. And, and, and you know, I still agree with you. It still obviously is very unfair on women. I mean, it just shows the culture that people are operating in. The last one here, so 45% of single parents, the vast majority, so 90% of single parents are women, are living in poverty. So... Um, yeah. We'd mentioned before that obviously single parents are more likely to live in poverty. And it's just crying out for the point to be made. How can we reduce the number of single parents then if it's such a problem? But no, that would be absolutely taboo. You probably lose your job if you mention that in a Scottish school. But it's, it's also a sort of societal pressure decision. Like, like for, for the man to, to drop out and allow his, his wife or his partner to carry on working is still very much sort of sort of seen as a bit strange and a bit of an odd decision, you know, and that, that's just a barrier that's not been broken down. So e even in a case where you might have the, the, the mother making a bit more money, you might still find that the, 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 the decision between the two of them is for the, the man to go back to work and let the woman stay at home and, and do those traditional mother sort of jobs. So, so you know, it's, yeah. it's, a very, it's a very interesting one, I think really difficult to break down when it's on two fronts like that, both an economic decision and a sort of social decision. So generally, mothers and fathers choose that it's the mother who's going to spend more time at home with the kids. Often that's what the mother wants as well. But as far as these two are concerned, this is a problem that needs solving. Just like the SNP thinks, by a remarkable coincidence. You know, you were saying earlier that generally girls do better than boys at school. Um, and, that, and that carries on right through to university. If you look even at the number of first yeah. degrees getting graduated, it's, it's women are better. And it's, so as you say, it's just... <laughs> well, <laughs> let's not, let's not go there. <laughs> Did you cast that? He said women are better, and she said, "Oh well, we know that." <laughs> joke, 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 joke. If someone tried to make us comment in the other direction, no matter how justified it might have been in some particular area, again, the teacher would have been out of their job. But then, then it's, it's once we enter the, the end of the workforce that that yeah. seems to 
their, their progress seems to stall and the male the males seem to overtake in terms of uh, earning power so yeah, yeah. Interesting. and i think the last big um reason for that is the gender pay gap what it means is generally speaking when you take into account all the things that women are maybe not able to do you've got far more men in higher paying roles far more men in promoted positions and even the type of work that women tend to go into um the jobs that pay more tend to be the science technologies all, all those kind of stem careers unfortunately for us pay a bit more so here we've just got a straightforward lesson in sort of feminist dogma no discussion feminist dogma being taught as fact there are actually lots of other reasons why women approach their careers differently often they have different priorities in life etc all of that swept aside completely straight down the line indoctrination it could have been coming straight from the mouth of nicola sturgeon for every pound that a man earns a woman earns around about 80 percent of that um, and I think there's a lot, it's never never funny to explain a meme without the meme actually being there, but there was a lot of memes surrounding the furlough pay that the government are doing at the moment. So what the government are doing at the moment for people who can't work is they're paying 80% of their wages. So quite a lot of people were saying, oh, well, that's men having to experience what it's like to be a woman. So uh, Just another dose of classic feminist grievance mongering. It's this idea that women can go into a workplace, they can do well, but for all the reasons that they've just been highlighting, they perhaps don't make that breakthrough into the, into the sort of top level of management. And let's be realistic, the top level of management is for the, the highest wages are paid, and, and it becomes a, becomes a real problem. And it's something that has been recognised, and people are trying to sort of break down, and people are trying to fix. Again, teaching us fact that this is a problem that needs to be solved, whereas actually, in a lot of cases, it's a reflection of the different priorities of men and women. I mean, think in your life. Think of women you know who've been really successful in their careers. Do they pursue that to the bitter end right through their 50s and 60s, or do they often get to the stage where they think, I've actually had enough of this. I want to put my energy into something else. It's not a huge amount of money, and yet even this huge amount of money seems to have some pretty strict limitations on it, which some people question, well, in that case, is this, is this really designed to actually get to the root of solving some of the problems that we saw last week in terms of, in terms of child poverty? Oh. Okay, so that's a UK-based measure to try and help families in poverty, and it's really criticised pretty severely and dismissed as maybe even not uh, well-intentioned. Well, let's say now about another UK initiative to try and tackle poverty. In the paragraphs that you're going to formulate in the next few weeks, we'll be saying things about how bad child poverty is. And you just need to know, first off, that this is something that tries to give people more money. So child tax credits trying to give people more money. However, you can actually pick up even more marks when it comes to by pointing out some of the flaws, I would say, in the system. So we've got there, you can earn even more marks if you can slate it. Uh, it's, it, it, I was say, it's, it's a really good example of this because there's probably a few of you guys who, who maybe claim the EMA or, or have EMA. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of practical example. So you can think yourself, what are some of the benefits and some of the, the, the negatives of it? So now onto an SMP scheme that involves paying young people above the some minimum school leaving age £30 a week to stay in school if their families are relatively low income. So what we've got here is a teacher could be speaking to a class where, you know, half the class is getting £30 a week from the government and is asking them to consider whether or not they think the government's doing a good job with that, whether or, not, whether or not that's a good idea. I mean, can you imagine anyone sitting there saying, no, I think the SNP shouldn't be giving me £30 a week? Hmm. So the government gives them the money to go to school, then in the school, the school teaches them about what the government's doing for them by giving them the money. Uh, the pupil equity funding is allocated directly to schools and schools were then challenged with saying, OK, we're going to give you a certain amount of money depending on um, the level of poverty that you have amongst your, your pupils and you then need to do something that will benefit that. It was about closing that attainment gap. We know that your, your, your background and your, the level of poverty you experience as a child is going to have a direct impact on how likely you are to do, how well you're likely to do at school. I mean, obviously, again, it's not a universal rule, but um, we can see that people from more affluent homes, for all sorts of reasons, uh, tend to do better in education than people from some uh, more high levels of poverty homes. And this was designed to try and fix that problem. It was to give them a hand up, and schools could be creative in, in any way that they wanted 
uh, and use that money in a whole range of stuff. And we've seen right across the country totally different approaches in different council areas and amongst different schools, but all of them driving to try and try what they call close the attainment gap, to try and make it so that there was more equity between uh, the chances of someone from a very poor household doing well and the chances of someone from a very affluent household doing well. Well, John Sweeney could have scripted that part, couldn't he? That's just a promotion of SNP policy. Now, the whole idea of closing the attainment gap, we would take a different view on that. Not even the faintest consideration that maybe this target is an appropriate one for schools, but it's just like a, an SNP party political broadcast. We are looking at three different, um, three different government responses today, which have tried to tackle the problem. Um, of women suffering from income and wealth inequality and social inequality. So that's basically, the glass ceiling is just the word for a kind of an invisible barrier that stops women progressing from, um, from lower to more promoted positions. Any organisation, so any company, business that had more than 250 employees um, had to publish their gender pay gap. So they basically had to say our gender pay gap is... 18. Our gender pay gap is whatever percent it is. Um, so lots of big companies did that. Some came out well. You had Channel 5 when they reported theirs. They had a gender pay gap of 2%. There's a bit of public pressure there to look at these companies and say, well, you need to start doing something about it. Whereas if you don't have to publish it, well, who, who really knows? They may be able to ask you, but you're actually having to go out and say, well, we have extreme inequality in our company. Or like the Channel 5 one, Everyone was like, well, what are they doing? Because that's amazing. Well, some, co well, some companies say, yep, it's 30% and it's for X different reason. We're not going to do anything about it. They're not actually saying to them, your gender pay gap needs to be below 20%. I think something like that could be more effective. Yeah, so what you suggested maybe like setting a target saying, as well as reporting this, you now need to get to like 20%. Now that, you, can't have a, yeah. you can't have a gender pay gap. Okay, yeah, I think that's true. I, I played quite a long section there. But you can see there, there's no pretense that this is some sort of balanced educational approach. This is just, the female teacher here is just preaching her message. She's expressing her personal opinion to the kids as part of the syllabus, which is exactly what the syllabus is intended to engender. Um, so the idea behind this Scottish Government scheme is basically to give more free hours to people in order for women to be able to go back to work. Um, sooner than they previously would have or for more hours and if you can go and work I don't know if they're getting 600 free hours per year if you can add that to the amount of hours that you're working then as a female that makes you a little more equal in the workplace would you agree? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so it absolutely maximizes your opportunity to try and make more money and helps reduce that, that gender pay gap, they can, they, can earn, they can work more, they can earn more over a lifetime and they can hopefully reduce um, that, that pay gap that exists currently between themselves and males. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was going to say, like, even my brother and his wife, uh, my brother's wife only works part time. They've got two children and based on this, she's been able to expand her hours quite significantly. So as a result, she's now gaining more experience, she's now a better chance of getting promotions and she's going to go up and hopefully earn, earn more money as the, her um, working life continues. And the other side of the argument, the argument that it shouldn't actually be the mission of the government to be separating children from their mothers at the earliest possible stage, the argument that actually being with mum in the early years might actually be best for kids, the argument that a lot of mums actually want to be with their kids, so it's not fair to be taxing those families in order to subsidise the ones where both parents want to work, all those other points not even vaguely considered. The two teachers here, they may as well be wearing SMP rosettes. And we're asking you to find evidence that shows that ethnic minorities suffer from uh, income and wealth inequalities. You've learned quite a lot of the reasons for the other groups and some of them are very similar. Um, they do revolve in a, in a way around discrimination and things. So we want you to have a think about why that is. Well, of course, you can't preach feminist grievance mongering for the whole course. You need to move on to another area of identity politics. So then they're going on to race. Notice the way it's introduced. Your mission is to find evidence of discrimination and inequality. So the whole thing has been set up for the identity politics, grievance mongering mindset. And the young people have been led through this on an industrial scale in Scottish schools. Just before we leave looking at the teaching of modern studies, 
Well, we had a few messages from people about their personal experiences. This is one from a, a very recent pupil of modern, modern studies. The teacher we had was openly very left-wing. He took part in pro-EU People's Vote marches in London on several occasions. He was also very open about his political opinions. When these students pushed him for explanations on things, he would deliberately phrase explanations so that they were very left-wing biased. It felt like he would try to convince others of his opinions before they got their own opinions. And this is from a parent. Both my daughters took Nat 5 Modern Studies and it was pretty clear that the course was about pushing liberal progressive ideology. Parents and I revealed the open biases of the teaching staff. Important topics such as violence, immigration law and the political process are all taught from a purely left-wing perspective. America is studied from a completely Democrat point of view with no attempt at any balanced discussion. I've had several debates with my daughters over dinner about topics they've been taught that day and it was clear that alternative or opposing views were never considered or portrayed in very simplistic, stereotypical ways. So to conclude, number one, the modern studies syllabus topics reflect a left liberal progressive agenda. Number two, the syllabus and resources fail to address these issues in a neutral manner. Number three, teaching reflects the left liberal progressive views of teachers as is intended. Now, the educational establishment in Scotland, Education Scotland, GTCS, who insist that teachers hold these sort of views as well, uh, the SQA, universities, schools, teachers, through the whole of that establishment, I'm not aware of any dissent about the indoctrination through modern studies. But it's exactly what the SNP want. What they've created is a situation where if you say to a young person, you know, I think the gender pay gap actually reflects natural differences in priority between men and women. What they hear is something like you think nitrogen's in the wrong place on the periodic table, or you think the First World War ended in 1923, because SNP political ideology is taught in schools as fact. Now, the strategy of the Conservative Party seems to be something like oh, well, we better just go along with it and say the same things as the SNP and then we'll be OK. But this is a serious problem and we need to put Scottish Family Party MSPs into Holyrood where we would expose the problem and put real pressure on the government to stop using schools as ideological training camps. Now, as I said partway through the video, please, someone come onto our live stream and debate this with me. Someone come and defend modern studies. I'd love for that to happen. But to be honest... I think it's pretty unlikely, but if there is someone who'll do it, that's great. So all that remains now is for you to join the Scottish Family Party via the link below. Thanks for watching.